Psalms 127, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Now listen to what he says here, and I want you to take note, because this is where I'm going to pull my, my thought from today. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. <laughs> I heard a no wow out there somewhere, yeah. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Go ahead and lay your Bibles down. And we're going to go before and speak, talk to the Lord right now and ask him to speak to our hearts and our minds. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. Lord, you, you instituted a man and a woman to be joined together to form a family and to bear children. And we're thankful for that, God. There's no confusion in the house of the Lord in this subject. We ask for your divine unction and help, Lord, to bring forth your word to help us, Lord, in not only bearing children, but in raising them, instructing them, helping them to develop so that when they launch, they fly true and to the target. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Before you're seated, just reach over and greet the person near you. Say, glad you're in church today, and uh, do that two or three people, and you can be seated. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 19 and 14 says, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I want to speak for a few seconds on the arrow and the archer. The church, the word of God, the Bible, the presence of God is for the family. In fact, when the plan of salvation was delivered in Acts chapter 2, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It did not stop there. It says, for the promise is unto you and to your children. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. To the children. I love it. I got a ball bouncing in the altar. Amen. Brother Lulu, you're doing a great job. You know, let me clarify something. We're, we're an apostolic Pentecostal church. What does that mean? If you turn in your Bibles to Act 2 and 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. To be apostolic is to continue in the, the apostles' doctrine. We're still doing how they did. Understand and the glaring problem with churches today is they've Abandon the true biblical tenets of a close walk with Jesus and his blood-bought apostolic church and instead have created gatherings under the guise of the church of humanism-infused concerts led by life coaches teaching you social and financial success. God defines what a church is. We don't. I'll understand there may be some entertaining things around here, but church was not meant for you to be entertained. It was actually meant for us to entertain the presence of the Lord. Amen? Praise God. I'm not, the church is not, and Sunday school is not, and youth nights are not like sitting down on your couch with a bag of popcorn watching a movie. In fact, you'll find, if you will study it out, that entertainment has become the opiate of the masses, and that's why society has gone the way it has, is because we're no longer instructed in the ways of life by a creator, but humans have, and that's why they call them programs, are sitting there and filling us and causing our minds to be more like mush than fearfully and wonderfully made human beings with a will and a purpose. And so we 
as apostolic Christian parents, have a tremendous responsibility given to us when the Lord blesses us with a child. Now, I did say that for a reason, because I wanted to say this, and I need you to hear me clearly, especially with today's paradigm. Your children will have identity issues if they are not if they are raised in an apostolic church, but not an apostolic home. So understand, when God entrusts you with a child, he entrusts you with the responsibility of raising that child in the ways of the Lord and establishing early in their young life a foundation built upon Jesus Christ. It is a tre this tremendous responsibility that causes us to think of baby dedications, what we're doing today, as really family consecrations. Thankful for the church. You have to understand the church is a family, and it has a responsibility to each and every child that comes here. When Jesus spoke in Matthew 18, he said, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But who shall, shall offend, listen, one of these little ones which believe in me, you teach them not to believe. Listen, listen, folks, this is serious. Listen, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that we were drowned in the depths of the sea. The Lord takes children very serious. He takes the raising of children very serious. And he puts a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of those who decide to lead families. What's wonderful is children receive a number of positive expressions, notations in scripture. They're repeatedly spoken of as blessings of the Lord. And so as you're Working real hard, Brother Joe, that is a blessing of the Lord. If we get to hear some scream out of the mother's room back there, they're a blessing of the Lord. When you're driving past McDonald's and you've just spent a lot of money on a healthy meal and they say, happy meal, happy, they're a blessing of the Lord. When you've just bathed them and got them ready for bed and you turn your back for one minute, and you walk in and they found your flower container and there's flour and jelly and other things out of the, all over the place. They're a blessing of the Lord. Genesis tells us that, and he lifted up his eyes and saw the woman and the, and the children and said, who are those with thee? And he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Psalms 128.3 says, Thy children, like olive plants, around thy table. There's always something wonderful going on with children around. This expression in our text grabbed my thoughts as I prepared for today. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Those new babies are arrows in your hand. Arrows are weapons of precision and accomplishment. I like to say I spent a number of years being a bow hunter. And uh, I would probably still be spending a lot of time and attention to detail in that. But I, I, I gave that up and I said, God, I sacrificed that so that I could be a better pastor. A lot of times you have to understand that there's a lot of effort that goes into archery. Anybody can go get a scope mounted on a rifle and reach out and touch an animal at three, 400 yards away and knock it down. Cool. But I've seen the whites of their eyes. Touched them. 
Mm -hmm. I've had them get this close to me because if you're going to use a bow and arrow, you're just going to have to take it to the next level. So understand, children as arrows, the ultimate success depends on the aim of the archer. Your children as arrows have to be carefully fashioned, crafted, molded, and balanced. You just can't let anybody have an effect or an influence on your child. It could alter the direction. As a, as, as a bow hunter, I, I paid attention to the wind. I paid attention to the thermals. I paid attention to anything in my path or the flight of the arrow. I, I, I can't tell you how many times that I, I, I just knew the way was clear. And I, I remember one time as I, I watched, I watched this nice buck just, just messing with his antlers in a tree. And I said, I'm just going to slide this arrow right through that gap. And I'm going to take him down. And I'm, I've been spending hours and I've scouted and I've hunted and I've walked and I've hiked. And I line it all up and I get ready and I launch that arrow. And I know the arrow's launched true, but at the last minute, that one limb that I failed to see sent the arrow away from its target. We got to be careful. Our arrows, our children are intended for flight. They're intended for a purpose. They're not just some camp and chass mistake like the world wants to let you believe. They're intended for a target. They're intended for maximum impact. on Every one of our children, right, we tell you, you can be anything, you can do anything, and it's true. But if we're going to say that and believe that, we need to raise them up so they can accomplish that. There is no mistake in this room. Louis Pasteur, who's as time has gone, has become less and less well known, said, when I approach a child, they inspire me to two sentiments. Oh, what a blessing of the Lord in there. Tenderness for what they are and respect for what they may become. Our children were designed by their creator to make an impact on the world, to live for a reason to set their minds towards a goal, to accomplish a purpose, to count for something in God's great scheme of things. Many know the story of Samson. Samson, the mighty, strong warrior. The Bible tells us in Judges, but his father and his mother, listen, his parents knew not that it was of the Lord. They just had a baby and they didn't realize that the Lord had called him from the womb. I'm going to raise up a Samson. And it says that the Lord sought an occasion against the Philistines. He, he was raising up a child to fight against the enemy that was messing with his people. That child sitting next to you is more than just a baby. That child's been raised for a reason. God caused it to be born for. Be careful. The person sitting next to you, that little one that you've had to change their diaper spoon feed those strained carrots too. All the other little things that come with raising that child may raise up one day to help you. <laughs> Your child is of God. God has a plan. I dare say today that when you abort a child, you abort God's plan. Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Speaking of Jeremiah, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Mm, think about that. Why don't you turn to someone right now and say, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. It ain't over, it's not finished. Understand that plan that God has for you comes with instructions. In fact, God once said of Abraham, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, Genesis 18 and 19. My challenge today, my, 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 my point today as the Archer 
holds the arrow. Where will you aim your child? What will be required of you as a parent to accomplish launching your child? Now, let me say this. I know it's a challenging time to be a parent. And in all transparency, I'm glad I don't have a little one at home right now. Not for the reason you're thinking of right now, but I'm old and I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> Praise God, hallelujah. I, I enjoyed my grandkids coming this, this year. It's absolutely wonderful. But I love the fact when we were done with the pool, I went and took care of myself. And daughter had to go deal with all that mess. I was glad when then we had little mistakes and little boo-boos. You can go clean that mess up. It starts coming out the top of that diaper. Oh, no. You know why it's, they call you grandparents? Because it's grand being the parent. They ain't got to do that. <laughs> amen. Can I get an amen from some hind end wiping parents? Um, thank God that's all I wear. How did you make that sometime? Blow my mind what comes out of them little things. <laughs> The story of a pastor visiting a young family. The father launched into a long lament about parenting in our high-pressure, high-speed society. <laughs> the pastor turned in. You're right. It's hard raising a child today. But there's one thing harder than being a parent today. That's being a child. As parents, we must have an idea of the end result of our influence. As parents and guardians, we must see in a little boy a God-fearing gentleman. And what we must see in a little girl is a God-fearing lady. One writer advised that every parent realize that when their child is three years of age, they have done more than half they will ever do for its character. Another one stated, there are only three ways to teach a child. First is by example. The second is by example. And the third is by example. It is by your example that you aim the arrow. And sometimes that term, chip off the old block, can come back to haunt you. <laughs> so what's involved in dedicating a child to the Lord? Holding a service that's dedicated and just directed to this important endeavor. As mentioned, children are the heritage of the Lord. God gives or, or loans children to bless us. And because of this, we must be willing to give them back to him. We must be willing to totally submit our children to the will of God. An excellent, perfect example of dedicating a child to the Lord is given to us in 1 Samuel. Hannah being barren or without a child for many years was weeping before the Lord because of her barrenness. And as she was weeping, she made a vow to God. She vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child. Just one little boy. Come on, ladies, just one of the little boy. She said, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. God honored Hannah's request and gave her a son named Samuel. Hannah then, in keeping her vow, dedicated or set apart Samuel unto the Lord. So we see her a beautiful example of what our attitude should be towards our children and their relationship to God. I, I don't have a choice here because they're gods. I want to make sure that he's, I'm doing my part for when they go back to God, he's not looking at me, what did you do with this child I lent you? We're to do everything we can to set them apart unto God. Isn't it funny that we'll take time and care if you got 
some dishes that were handed down. You'll put them in that little curio cabinet or you've got that gun that's been an heirloom handed down from your great grandfather and we'll take such take great care of it but we'll turn around and take a child that God has handed us and we'll throw them out to the whims of the world and set them in front of a TV without any type of filter and then we turn around and wonder why are they like this? So by dedicating and consecrating yourself you are making a commitment and a vow to raise them in his ways. Proverbs 22 and 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I can tell you, there is, there is some selfish reasons to really like the church and really like that. Ain't nothing better than some good old moral offspring to turn around when you get old and you start needing help, that you can trust their decisions, you can trust their judgment, and you can trust as maybe you become a little infirm and things start getting, that you can trust their choices and their decisions for you. You know, and you have to understand if you live long enough, the body kind of doesn't quite hold up. You might find yourself again bald-headed with diapers on before it's all said and done. It just depends on your situation. <laughs> so children aren't born straight arrows any more than you can go out in the forest and find a twig that's going to be absolutely perfect. So children are like crooked twigs. There's a sin nature there. I never forget as my two-year-old son, this innocent angel of God that the Lord gave me as I walked into my kitchen one time and you know the reason I'm walking in there is he got out from my sight for a second I walked in there and he goes like this where did he learn that think about that where did he learn it from me when I get to the subject I ain't got to hide when I go get a cookie where did he learn that that's that sin nature. Let's, let's be real. We all know it's in there. It comes from the fall. And he did that. I looked at him. And then I looked at his trail. <laughs> Here's, I, didn't, I don't mind that he had a cookie. I mind that he didn't ask me to get the cookie. Because of the danger he put himself in to get it. Are you hearing me? Children need honing. They need teaching. They need instruction. They need nurture. They need care. It is that influence that is a parent's most important occupation. You can do a lot of things. I, don't just provide money. Just don't provide a roof and clothes. Nurture them. Houses will change. Clothes will grow old. But the children are what's important. Psalms 51 reminds us, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Conceive me. Romans 5 says, and so our mandate from God is to take crooked twigs, somehow form it and fashion it into a true straight and polished arrow ready for flight. I admonish you as parents to be living examples of Christ to your children. Learning, I, I made a mistake there. Can I tell you, making a mistake, everybody's going to make mistakes. But when you turn around and honest with your kids, I messed that up. You help them learn it. Oh, I can make mistakes and my mom and dad are still going to love me. And I can turn and do right. The worst thing you can ever do is act like you're perfect. And I'm going to tell you another lie. Stop telling your kids and do as I say, not as I do. Really? Mm-hmm. It doesn't do your child any good to instruct them in the way of the Lord and you yourself not walk what you talk. It's good always to remember and always be examining yourself and your witness to your children. The Bible says, a just man walketh in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. Children are a blessing, but parents, we too must be a blessing. Not blessing them with things, but blessing them with an example. 
the main reason for the blessed state of children is that they have someone to look to and to use as an example to model their own behavior. And trust me, they're watching your behavior. I, I often laugh when I'm around parents and their little kids do something. And, you know, you kind of look at the mom and dad a little bit. Oh, I know which one they got that from. <laughs> so the Bible encourages parents and guardians to strive to be an example to their children as Christ was our example. Amen. These children that I read were brought to Jesus. They were hoping that he might touch them. The disciples were trying to shoo him off, but Jesus kind of got all right and said, wait a minute. Don't you push children away. They need my touch. They need my influence. Don't ever get between a child and the Lord. Do I need to say that again? Don't ever come between a child and their creator. Children are at the very center of the church and the kingdom of God. Jesus stated, unless you accept the kingdom of God as the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then he gathered up children's arms, laid hands on them. Bless them. It's important that children feel the touch of God on their life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Our children were designed by their creator to make an impact on this world, to live for a reason, to set their minds toward a goal, to accomplish a purpose, to count for something in God's great scheme of things. Arrows are designed to fly. I almost brought my boat case and opened it up and set it up, but then I was a little afraid I might be enticed to pull the bow back, and I really don't want to dislocate my shoulder in front of you. But there's a lot of details that go into arrows, even modern arrows. Uh, I know it, they, they've made it easy because of some of the uh, stuff they make them out of today. But it still takes a lot of effort and time to produce one that's going to fly true and fly straight, fly good. Now, why do I say that? Arrows were never meant to stay in the quiver. The quiver is just a vehicle that carries them until they're ready for the right time for its release. You might say the arrows were made to be released. They were made to fly. And so it is with our children. As painful it is, is to let them go, they were never intended to stay within the four walls of our homes. Our home was merely a means to prepare them and mold them and straighten them and balance them and give them wings that when the time came, when they will be released. Listen to me, parents or archers. Your arrows were made to fly. Prepare them to fly successfully. Don't only prepare them to just simply fly, but to fly straight, to fly true, that they will make an impact on the target. It's important to develop that ability. That's why they're in your hands. God said of Abraham, for I know him. He will command his children. I remember my young son, we got a flat tire, and I took him out there and taught him how to change a tire. Every man should know how to change a tire. It's a sad day today in our modern world. Uh, men aren't even learning that stuff anymore. They get their hands dirty, and they're looking for some sandy wash, and I'm like, One author has written, letting go is a God-given responsibility as important as love in the parent-child relationship. Teaching a child in the way he should go, teaching him simple, basic things is important. Teaching in the ways of God is even more important because there's going to be a day comes when they get discouraged. 
There's going to be a day come when the world feels like it's weighing heavy on them. There's going to come a time when everything might feel like it's against them. And they're going to need to know that they were fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator and a God that loves them. And no matter what they face, they can stand up and go again. Amen, parents. So understand, without release, children can't fully grow. You have to slowly release them bit by bit. Give your children roots and wings, the old saying goes. Love them, protect them, nurture them with a strong sense of God and family and let them go. We raise them in order to release them. Releasing our children is an important part of being a parent. It's not easy to do. It's quite difficult. The terrible twos weren't easy. When they're colic, it's not easy. Teenage puberty's not easy. When they get toothaches, it's not easy. When they get their first broken heart, it's not easy. When they put on that little ridiculous uniform for their first job at a fast food restaurant, it's not easy. <laughs> when they come to you and tell you that's what they're going to do, it's not easy. <laughs> Letting go contradicts the nature of a parent because we fear the loss of influence. But that lets us know how important our influence is. And it's a point that we cannot deny. We are having an influence. It's important no matter how long you live or how old your children get to be a godly influence. We don't want to give up parental control. You spend all those years taking care of those little children. They're dear to you, and you, 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 you've hatched them in your own little nest, and you've raised them and from the day they were born, and you've been responsible for provision and for protection. You've shielded them, prayed for them, agonized over them, fought for them, fought with them. When it comes to that business of letting go, it feels like it diminishes your role. It doesn't feel good. But in the end, this little dude that you're trying to hold on to will get free. You'll have to let him go. In John 3, there's a turning point in his ministry where he says, I must in, he must increase and I must decrease in a way that describes well the role of a parent. The child must increase and we must decrease. Their personal responsibility to the Lord starts to become their responsibility. They have to have their own walk with God. And they get that by your teaching. I said this the other night. It's important to be in the house of the Lord. And I know you get weary and I know you get tired, but there's a day coming you're going to be up all night wondering where they are. But you see, if you raise them right, you raise them in church. Let me tell you where I'm at, Mom. Let me tell you where I'm at, Dad. And it's good things, and it's good places because you raise them right. You bonded over a lifetime. It began with utter dependence. The child has developed. And it's so hard to see that in little William. But if you look around the room and we see a adult Tia, just went on a flight and just landed yesterday. A little bit of a release there, Mom. I'm looking. I look over at Ashley's kids and I'm blown away. Hey, it still amazes me that he's not on your head right now. <laughs> it's awesome. Little Nathan in the back. You guys are important. It's vital. And, and not only is your family here, but the entire church family is here to raise you and help you be protected. And the, let me tell you something. You might just get your first job by a connection right here in the church. You might get your first car because of some people here in the church. You might get directed to the right insurance agency. You never know. You, might, you know what? You might get in a stupid blow of parents and, hey, pastor, I need a couch tonight. I've been an idiot. Let's be real. The, the, there's so many people who don't understand all the things that come with the church. 
the church will help you. I learned to clean up, use deodorant, and brush your teeth, and comb your hair, and how to dress for a job interview. You don't, you don't, don't lie to yourself. Be honest. My God, all I had when I, when I got out of high school was a pair of 501s. They still wear 501s. They're still around today. Back in the day, I had some white 501s. Y'all don't even say nothing about damn port. A pair of white 501s and a teacher. Ozzy Osbourne concert teacher. Bad to the bone. Can you imagine going to a job interview wearing that? Why can't I get that? They're showing up with crazy looking blue hair and pink hair and metal all over their face and stuff marked all around. I can do the job. We'll get back with you. Let's be real. If you're going to be the face of a company, you've got to be a face that they want is for the company. And I'm thankful. So it's what's not that you got to wear a suit, but there's something about knowing, you know what, I'm going to we'll be in a, in a group of people. I need to clean my act up. I, I need to treat them to the best of me like I want the best of them. Things that unintended consequences of being a part of the church. Church is a wonderful thing. When one of the grandmothers walks over there and grabs that phone from that little boy to teach Brother Joe to take it from him, he'd stop throwing it then. He's just learning. It's just, you got to understand, it's Joe's first service with the boy today. So they're learning together. If they figure it out, and spank them little biscuits and say, no, you ain't doing that no more, pal. Was that subtle enough? <laughs> Another reason it's hard to let go. It's not only painful, it can be confusing. You would think that <laughs> my wife's laughing. <laughs> I might get an ear from when I get home today, guys. Unintended consequence of me coming to church. <laughs> Except I don't get it from her. I Erica's she doesn't restrain what she wants to say either, so it's not easy being the pastor. You know, you think that smothering your child and abandoning your child would be opposite ends of the spectrum, but really it's only a razor's edge apart. When am I smothering? When am I abandoning? When am I doing too much? When am I doing too little? When am I interfering and when am I neglecting? Not easy to know. It's difficult. It's sadly done by people who haven't taken a class on having children. We take a class on driving a car. We take a class on math and English and all this. Thing. Where's the class on children? <laughs> you get the idea, hey, children's a good idea. What did we do? You know, parenting's like flying a kite. <laughs> I think many of our kids would like us to go fly a kite. But understand, I'm going to do my best to make a metaphor out of this one, guys. You see, when it, when it comes to flying a kite, there's always got to be a certain amount of tension. Got you. you always got to try to keep a little tension on the string. Because if you don't, and the string gets slack, what happens? <clears throat> It'll fall. It'll get hurt. Something might get broken. But the problem is if you give it too little string, you can cause the string to break and the same thing happen. The tension is the intentional and necessary in flying a kite as it is to parenting. It's subtle. Lord, guide my steps. Order my way as I try to train up this child in the way that he should go. So as difficult it is to raise children, there are some positive sides to it. This is the toughest part of the message, folks, is digging this one up. 
Just kidding. There is a sense of accomplishment when you take in their room and turn it into your den or sewing room. Not just teasing. There is a sense of accomplishment when you watch them because you put the time in and they start getting those successes. I laugh because there's, there's, there's research that says, you know, depending on a child leaves the home, dictates whether they got to come back to restart again. Anybody leave and end up back? Don't raise your hand. And then if you don't do a good job parenting and you raise them or fail to raise them, grandparents are not raising them today, that's, that's what's going on today. So if you raise them right, there's a sense of accomplishment, a sense of completeness and rightness. So despite the pain of loss, there's a deep underlying sense of relief that you've actually accomplished what God has given you to do. But letting go isn't something we have to do all at once. It's a lifelong process. Besides, when I used to practice bow hunting, I would take arrows and I would practice, practice, and practice until I got really good at releasing. Because the fly tip of arrow is directly connected to the release. Now, when I first shot instinctive, which means I used my fingers in the feel, this may not mean nothing or interest to any of you, but to some of the guys in here, there's a roll off your finger tips. And if, you, if the roll was too great, you would cause a little bit of sway in your arrow. And so they came out with another a trigger thing that you, you used attached to the string. You know what that was called? A release. And it allowed you to pull it back straight without the roll of your finger and you pull the trigger and it instantaneously launched it, help keeping the arrow straight. <laughs> Who knew? God in his magnificent wisdom provides us multiple opportunities to practice releasing our children before that ultimate release when they leave home for good. In fact, if you stop and think about it, you start releasing your child the moment at birth. That small matter of simply cutting the umbilical cord is a, is a first way of realizing I'm ultimately letting go of this child. That little snip and the initial sharing is over. Suddenly you're holding an independent life system in your hands. There's many, many more snips over the years. The weaning of the child from the breast or the bottle. That release to allow them to crawl and that nervous release as they begin walking. The graduation from strained veggies and other unappetizing delicacies. <sighs> Stewed prunes or whatever else you give them. Sherry turkey and chicken. Oh, Lord. The wonderful thing about the bottle and the breast is the, the exhaust pipe isn't so bad. But once you start giving them real food, all bets are off. And then the first time you leave them with a sitter. So there's a question we've got to ask ourselves. We've learned this. We've watched this. But we haven't really paid attention to it. We've got all these mini releases, but ultimately we have to consider what's the target? What are you releasing your children to? So life is too short to make random shots in the air. In fact, I wanted one time to see how far my arrows could fly. So I grabbed a, an arrow that was imperfect. It's really interesting, great demonstration for this message. And I pulled it back and I launched it up and I let it go. And it sh I mean, with these new, new bows today, they, they can do some amazing stuff. But because it was out of true, but the bow launch was just out of true, because that's why I shot it. I didn't care what happened to it. It went whoosh, 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 and then disappeared out of view. God, I don't want to launch my child to go like that. But the point is, you launch something in that way of something you don't care about. 
We're not talking about releasing children that way. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow made a, made a statement. He wrote a poem. I'm just going to grab a part of it. It's literally called the, the Arrow and the Song. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth. I knew not where. For so swiftly it flew the sight. Could not follow it in its flight. God has given us arrows that are too precious to waste like that. I don't want to take random chances with my children or the children of this church. We've got to release them into Christian adulthood. When, we let, when, 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 when you're helping them grow up and you're releasing your child into manhood or womanhood, if you're a good student of God's word, you'll have a clear view of what the bull's eye is and what they must become and what it looks like. You're releasing them into a personal relationship and responsibility to God. Moses was instructed of God to tell the people of Israel, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. In other words, teach your children, teach your children. Always be teaching your children the ways of God. Always realize line them, always recorrect them, help them stay true to God because they are an individual that are going to have to spend eternity somewhere and I hope you've launched them in the right direction with the right mindset and develop them to have spine and they'll have to have spine and some form of rigidity to handle the forces that come against it as it flies because as they step out our own, on their own they must have their own personal faith, not just an inherited faith. And we have to prepare them for that because once arrows are launched, there are no more strings attached. Children are not a personal experiment. Well, I'm going to say something. God created them. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. God chose their gender when God created life. And God gave you this child to bring to maturity, not for that child to be manipulated by government, societies, cultural agendas. I wasn't gonna say this, but I'm saying, I read an article this week that lit me on fire and got me mad. One of the, the very points of this gender confusion came from one of our schools of higher learning and the college and, and uh, higher level, decided how much money they could make with this paradigm. Medically, they would have so many extra surgeries as they removed certain items off the body of a child. And then there would be the money made by the psychological help they were going to need after they made such decision. It's out there. Go read it. It's one of the places it came from and got started to understand if you realize what's going on, it's all about money. And the Bible covered this. It said, for the love of money is the root of all. You understand, follow the money in some things here. Find out why are they do why would they want to push this mess? Don't let your children or your child become a commodity to the influence of the well, everybody's doing it. Not mine, not the Lord's, not the house of God. This is a safe place. Listen to this. Like the father of the prodigal son in Luke 15, it was painful to watch him leave and go live on his own. But it's something sometimes we got to do. He had to let his son make his own mistakes. And as much as he wants to sell, tell his son how to live, he granted him that freedom. And that arrow was flying on its own now. That lets us know there'll be mistakes made from time to time. It also means there will be consequences for those mistakes. True love, the kind of love God demonstrates in Scripture, doesn't remove consequences from decisions or choices. I hear people often say, pray for me. Why? You're still doing what you're asking me to pray about. When you're done, come home. Are you hearing me? And that thought may be a little frightening to the young adult who's on their own, but with a bit of fear comes the exhilarating sense of responsibility and a strong sense of encouragement and affirmation. Understand, you know you're leaving, so therefore you know where to go to get it fixed. 
Galatians 6 and 10, as we therefore have opportunity, let's do good unto all men, especially them who are the household of faith. Church, we need to allow people to make mistakes and get back up. We need to allow people, no matter what age they walk into, to finally get things right, to come on in. Mm -hmm. Arrows. Children are a wonderful heritage. Parents, I admonish you, do never let the world cause you to dislike the church. Never let society try to diminish the value of the church. In the church age in this country, when everybody went to church on Sunday, this was a wonderful country. And you can't tell me you don't like a good, solid Christian boss or supervisor. Mm -hmm. Don't ever let the world cause you to dislike the church and the family of God. Young people, they're not in here, but parents, I admonish you to tell your, 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 your young people, church is your family. Again, I've gotten people jobs. I've helped people get vehicles. I've helped people put tires on cars because I care about people. And I know many of you have too. You got a good family right here. In fact, if you got a plumbing problem, Brother Joe probably help you out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you got a kind of there's probably somebody in here that can help you with it. And how, anybody here been helped by somebody in the church before? Why don't you wave your hands? And, hey, I'm telling you, what a family. It's a great family. Amen. You're meant to be connected to the church. You're meant to be connected to the Lord. It's an important household to be a part of. And it's the only thing Jesus is coming for. So remember, my church family has loved me. My church family has encouraged me. My church family is cheering me on. My church family has not abandoned me. My church family has blessed me. My church family has taught me. My church family has helped me. My church family has put up with me in many ways. Can I get an amen? My church family is there for me. And my church family is never glad to get rid of me. Can I get an amen? So now that you have roots, you got to have wings. You see, this concept saved the prodigal in the end. Because he came home and he resumed flight school. May God grant those of us who are blessed to be fathers and mothers the strength to draw our bows to the fullest and the wisdom to release our arrows with practice skill. May we make every arrow count because blessed is the man whose quiver is full. Every child matters. I don't know how you've related to everything I've said this morning. Some of you are parents still practicing the release. <laughs> some of you are parents of young people that are about to fly on their own. And some of you let your arrows fly years ago. So you'll relate to this different today. And I could go over each one of those, but I will not belabor that. Understand. So I talk to every individual today. Even if you've blown the release. Or you haven't flown straight. You've missed the mark. Your father, your heavenly father has not changed. His love for you has not changed. And whoever you are today, no matter how old you are today, if you'll come and be his child, he will receive you with open arms and a clean robe and a new start. Old things can pass away. Old things can be forgiven and he will receive you again. Amen. <laughs> Perhaps you've had a child who's blown the release and you sit here today. You did your best to grasp the responsibility of being a parent. 
you did your best at aiming those arrows at the target of godliness, and you did the best job you could of releasing them, but somehow they did not fly straight. They have not hit the target, and they've even gone astray. The same Heavenly Father that received you and I, forgave us, will do the same for our children. He knows where they are right now, this very day. He knows the shackles of sin they've placed on their own lives. And like you, he still loves them. He will not cease to knock on that heart's door and call them back to the straight and narrow. The wonderful thing is Nehemiah and William prepare to come. God is still very much involved in their lives. You can, you can help him reach today. You can pray today and lift up that child to God, whatever your need is. Much like arrows, the ability to perform is directly connected to its preparation.